Well, hey, welcome to, uh, welcome to Bethesda House of Mercy tonight, and welcome uh, to, the, to the seminar. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, you know, it, it says a lot about people who step outside of the norm and want to come and continuously progress in the kingdom and uh, just continue to study and uh, dig further and deeper into the Word of God. You know, at, at, at no time in any time of my career did I ever think I had arrived, and uh, I always knew that there was more classes to take, more to learn, more to study. Uh, no one has gotten to the end of the rainbow yet, so to speak, and, and learned everything there is to learn. Uh, you keep messing around, and I will drop kick you in the chest. <laughs> so I'm unlike any other instructor you've had. I'm not afraid of violence. Uh, so with that being said, we're going to go ahead and start the seminar off tonight. We have myself coming up. So you have the worst instructor, followed by some outstanding gentlemen coming up, and uh, uh, Andrew, and then, of course, the closer, uh, Pastor Jerry. So we have uh, eight hours blocked out on time. We have tents in the back, uh, so everybody's settled, all right? Uh, Pastor Doug, would you mind praying for the class, please? Amen. All right. So <clears throat> Murphy Law states that if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong, and it has already. Uh, when I emailed my class, it was under Microsoft PowerPoint. Microsoft PowerPoint don't talk to Apple. It's like Jews and Gentiles back in the day. They don't really communicate well. So the PowerPoint don't really act like it did when I built it. So me and Andrew or me and Anthony are just going to try to play it by ear, and hopefully everything works out. But if not, don't worry about what it says up here. Don't freak out. Don't tap your neighbor on the shoulder and ask him what I just said. All right, we'll, we'll get it all figured out and then it all washes out. Does that make sense? You guys good? All right, go ahead and the, hit the first slide. Okay, so this is where we're headed tonight, Richard. I know you like to know where we're headed. So this is where we're headed. All right, we're going to talk about uh, we live with limited time. I'm not going to insult your intelligence. You can look up there and kind of see where we're headed tonight. I'm going to stick to my outline as... As, as close as I can, because I know we're, we're, we're kind of grasp on time, and I want to make sure that the other instructors get a, uh, get a chance to get up here and get things done. Uh, the biggest takeaway from this class, biggest takeaway from this class, is I challenge you to examine the way you spend your time. I challenge you to examine the way you spend your time, okay? Uh, next slide, please. I think we're there. Yes, thank you. All right. So there is a resource we have that is far more precious than your money. It is a resource that is universally unbiased and fairly distributed. Everyone has the same amount every single day. Everyone's supply is renewed every single day they are alive. It can be spent or wasted, but can never be saved or returned to you. It is, of course, your time. How precious is it? Well, reportedly, the dying words of Queen Elizabeth I uh, were these. All my possessions... For just a moment of time. Okay, so a little bit of exercise I want you to do real quick. I want everybody to close their eyes. And I want you to imagine living to be 80. Now, I know for some of you in this room, that's like two years away, all right? <laughs> Mainly Richard. I think you're the oldest now, right? Uh, but I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about your life if you lived to 80 and what might you wish you had had more time to do at the end of your life? What might you wish you'd have spent less time doing? So just think about that throughout the class. Go ahead and open your eyes real quick. One kind of personal thing that's happened in my life, and I haven't sent it out to the uh, pastors because I just kind of found out about it today. And, uh, you know, as I read it, I almost lost my breath. I, I was on Facebook. I just got done walking the dogs this morning, and I read a post from a friend of mine's wife who me and him had served together since like 2006, 2007 in the Marine Corps and I just recently found out that he had a heart attack. And uh, me and him real close friends and I told Jessica about it this morning. And uh, as I read the post, I kinda, kinda lost my breath a little bit and then I read on the end, but he's doing fine and he's recovering. And I immediately say, thank, thank you Lord, thank you for, for doing that for Zach. So I, I was able to call him today and when I called him up, of course, in true uh, Zach fashion, he goes, what's up, dude? You know, like nothing happened. 
you know, and I said, brother, am I so glad to hear your voice today, you know, so as we talked, he said, uh, he said, well, I'll tell you this, uh, I've definitely put some things in perspective, I'm definitely starting to look at my life, and to see how I'm spending my time, and I simply responded with, well, Zach, sometimes the Lord has a way of grabbing our attention, and getting us to understand where we are, and take stock of where we're at, so I just wanted to kind of say that because we don't know what's going to happen at the blink of an eye uh, or what's going to take place in our lives, but we need to be aware of our time and how we're actually spending it. Hello? This is Kay. Hey, how are you? It's good to hear from you. You know, I forgot to put my phone on silent, and I'm in class right now. Is there anything I can help you out with? So that's just a real quick reminder to put your phones on silent. All right, so you can't live without money. We know that because in life, we have to, pay, we have to pay, pay, for, pay for things. We have to pay rent. We have to pay mortgages. We have to put gas in cars, all that stuff. But when your time runs out, you're finished. So you have the same amount of this valuable resource that everyone else has. 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, 365 or 366 days in a year. That means everyone has 31,536,000 seconds or 525,600 minutes every year. No one gets more no matter how much money or power you have. Doesn't matter. But then why do some seem to get much more done and be such amazing producers? Well, the answer is, is of course, they're better stewards of their time. Being a good steward of our time is not just about the activities in our schedule. It's about how unified, encouraging relationships with other believers in worshipful positions towards the Lord, no matter what you do. With, time, with, the, with the time God gives you, we can honor God, living purposely, and love others as well. I think we're on that next slide. <clears throat> okay, so we live with limited time. It is short and it's uncertain, just like I explained about a friend of mine. And we can go through, and each, every, if we went around the room, each and every single one of us would have a story about something that took place uh, in a life unexpectedly. Uh, when I would teach about time management, or time, I wouldn't even say it's, it's not management, but when I talk about time, I would say that every 90 days, circumstances change in someone's life that would alter the way they're living right now. Every 90 days, circumstances change that alter your life. And you have to be prepared for those things. So we are created conscious of time, and most view time as a brief and uncertain commodity. God gives us limited years and made us conscious of that by making us conscious of eternity. So in Ecclesiastes 3 and 11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. No one I, I know would argue that life seems brief. I've only been on this planet 47 years, and when I look at Dakota carrying his son and his daughter, it makes me realize how precious time is, because I remember doing the same to him. So we all know that, that time passes by quickly here, and the older we get, guess what? The faster it goes. God's people knows that feeling well, and we know that we are, made, uh, we are made to feel that briefness of life, because this isn't our home, is it? We're just passing through. Psalms 39, 4 through 5 says, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than a handbreadth, which is the width of your hand, my entire life is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath away. So like I said earlier, we could be breathing right now. Ten seconds later, you stop breathing. Psalms 90, 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. James 4 and 14, <clears throat> Why you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. I'm not saying any of this to make you depressed about time, but we just need to realize that we, while we're here, we're, we have a mission. 
We have things to do here, and we can't afford to waste what? Time. So because time is so brief and so important, we should use it wisely. And, and how can we use it wisely for God? Next slide. Make sure I'm where I'm at. Okay, perfect. All right. So Paul gave careful instructions to his young church in Ephesus. Uh, Ephesians. Ephesians 5, 15, and 17, he says, Be careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not, make, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Make the most of every opportunity. If you want to live wisely in God's eyes, use your time and opportunities well. Paul understood the basic principle of using time. If you remember from when I, when I spoke a couple weeks ago in, uh, in, in church, I spoke of Paul and all the things that he was able to accomplish in his lifetime. And when you look at what Paul accomplished and all the persecution that was pushed upon him, you would think in your mind that that's not even humanly possible. Because today, in the United States of America, we cry and whine way too much. And we don't even know what true persecution looks like. You know, I just got a book in the mail that talks about the top 50 countries of where persecution is taking place. Right now, China is facing the most persecution ever. But do you know what's happening there? A movement from God. More people are being saved. More people are confessing their sins. More people are moving forward. More people are not wasting time. Sometimes it takes a little persecution in order for us to understand where we're spending our time. Hopefully, we can evaluate that before persecution comes. So Paul understood the basic principles of that. While he was in prison, he evangelized to his jailers, sang praises, uh, uh, praise songs to God, and wrote letters to his churches. Paul knew his time was limited, and he obviously felt the pressure to reach as many people as he could during his lifetime. Do we feel that sense of urgency today? I think it was uh, Kayla Hood that told me one time, I'm going to embarrass you, is that okay? You said, what if today was our last? What if today was our last day on earth? Something like that. Do you remember saying that? Or what if this was the last day before Jesus came back? Would we act any differently? I remember you telling me that like three months ago, four months ago. I can't remember what my wife said to me six seconds ago, but I can remember that. All right? But I think about that a lot. <clears throat> what if today was the last day before the Lord came back? I'm ready. But how many people around us are not ready? How many people don't know the Word of God? How many people don't know Jesus? That means we need to be serious about our time. God gives us, that God gives us and work hard to manage that time or, or plan that time accordingly. Proverbs 12, 11, he says, who, He who tills the land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless things lacks common sense. And good judgment. <laughs> Calling an idle man a fool seems a little bit harsh. But the Lord's judgment in the parable of the bags of gold in Matthew 25, 14 through 30 was also harsh. The man who received five bags put his money to work. He made five more bags for his master. The one given two bags of gold also gained two more bags of gold for his master. The third man that he entrusted with the least did not put his money to work. What did he do? He buried it. He hid it in the ground. And he was punished. Harsh? Yeah, I think that was harsh, right? But it was also necessary warning from God for us. Use well what we have been given. Time, material, resources. The Word of God often tells us to be diligent and alert using a variety of stories, context, synonyms among others. Hit next slide, please. Just want to make sure we're at. Man, that's, that's small, isn't it? I apologize. So you can just take your pen out and write these uh, verses down. It's okay, Stephen. You want to come up here and sit with me? Okay. Proverbs 12, 24. <clears throat> Diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in forced labor. Chancellor. Proverbs 12, 27. The lazy do not roast any game. But the diligent feed on riches of the hunt. Proverbs 13, 4. A sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. Proverbs 21, 5. The plans of the diligent lead to profit, 
as surely as haste leads to poverty. Mark 13, 33 tells us to be on guard, be alert. You do not know when the time will come. Ephesians 6, 7, and 8, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether, uh, whether they are slave or free. Next slide. 1 Timothy 4 and 15, it says, do be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. 1 Peter 1 and 13, therefore, with the minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. 1 Peter 4 and 7, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert, sober-minded, so that you may pray. 1 Peter 5 and 8, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around, around like a lion, roaring, looking for someone to devour. What does he devour? He doesn't just devour us, he devours our time. He's a good time bandit. We'll talk about that here in a few seconds, a few minutes. A good example also can be found in Proverbs 6, 10 through 11. Chancellor could probably give you this. This is one of his favorite verses. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. And poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. Michaela told me she heard this one morning when she was laying in the bed, and she was about to not go to the gym. And she heard the thing go, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. But she knew she needed to get up. She needed to get some work done. She needed to go to the gym. There was probably somebody there to minister, right? Pastor Sean was laying next to her, encouraging her by going... We'd also be wise to put to good use the time we have been given to serve him. We won't necessarily gain additional hours back, but we will, earn, we will earn the reward of hearing this. And this is what I long to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in the few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Think about how we spend our time here. I believe when we get to heaven, we're going to be thinking about all the time we spent with God down here and how precious this really was. The amount of time we are given is a mystery, and what God will bring for us in the hours and days ahead is also a mystery. So don't allow your time to be stolen. Next slide. So the devil is a time bandit. How do we know this? Well, the Word of God says it. John 10, 10, he says what? Thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, not just you, but to steal your time from you. I heard a story one time that a, a, a man gave his son a Christmas present. And in the Christmas present, he said, I give you one hour of my time every day so that we can do what you want to do. We can talk about what you want to talk about. And he gave that same Christmas present every year to his son, showing his son that he was given him the most valuable commodity that a father had. And what was it? His time. Here on earth, that's what our father longs for us. It's for us to give him our what? Our time. It's hard to build a relationship with God when you only call upon him when you're in trouble. Or when something goes wrong. Or when you need something. To me, if my sons only called on me, Dad, I need money. Dad, this. Dad, that. When they call, what would I be expecting? They want something. Is that a relationship? No, I call that a leech. God wants me to call upon him to say what? Hey, Dad, how you doing? <laughs> Thank you for what you're doing for me today. Thank you that you put this breath in my lungs. As Renata taught us Sunday night, Thank you for every time that I breathe, I say your name. We actually used that when we were out evangelizing or recruiting, right? Yeah. The enemy knows he has little time. Revelation 12, 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who live in heaven rejoice. But terror will come on the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing that he has little time. He knows he doesn't have much time left. He doesn't have much time. The one way he can affect you is by robbing you of your time, forwarding the kingdom. If he, can take away you, if he can take away your time from God, he's won. He's separated you. 
In my old life, I would review, I'd, I'd, I'd travel from station to station, offices to offices from uh, all over the place. And one of my main jobs at one point was a trainer. And my specialty was going out and looking at time, schedule sheets. My whole life, it didn't matter if they were successful or they were struggling, my, my, my focus was to look at their time, their schedules, and see uh, what else I could do to help them improve their scheduling. Because even, even if we're successful, could we use better, uh, better use of our time? Well, if you shake your head no, then you're unteachable. That's what I used to tell even the most successful Marines. If you shake your head no, then you're just unteachable. Because I guarantee you we can find what? Better way for you to spend your time. Zachariah called me one day from school to discuss his schedule. He was a freshman in college. Uh, love freshmen in college, right? Uh, he discussed his difficulties of juggling, juggling a full-time college schedule, uh, working and playing football. In case you don't know, whether you play D1, D2, or D3, or NIAA, BBB, CCC football, if you're at the collegiate level, guess what that is? It's a full-time job. And uh, Zachary talked to me about the other kids in his class and how some of them had already had went back home, had, had gone back home. And then uh, he, he ended the conversation with, uh, Dad, I really appreciate that you spent the time to teach me and brother how to build a schedule and get all of our stuff in it. And as I hung the phone up, I guess I, I, I kind of, I think I looked at my wife and I said, I think the Marine Corps taught me something. Hopefully it taught the kids something too, right? But we have to be able to manage our time. If we don't manage our time, we can get stressed out and we can be led astray. As Marines, we were taught to master our time, material, and resources. Leadership begins by being good stewards of our time. Anytime we planned an operation, we had to start a timeline from when it was going to end, and we had to backtrack it to when we start. And if we did that, and we kept running out of time, guess what we had to do? We had to go back to the drawing board and redo it, and continuously redo it. Andrew, you probably know what I'm talking about, right? Backward planning, constantly, to where every single second was accounted for. Every second. Think about that in your life. Can you look back on today and tell me exactly what you did at every minute of your day? That's what we had to keep accounting for every second. So it taught us to be, uh, <laughs> it taught us to look for certain things in our schedule to make sure that things fit in there. Scripture tells us to redeem the time that we make the most of time uh, we've been given by living in the light of eternity. We'd be wise to consider these verses and choose how to spend our time. Ephesians 5, 15, 17, 1 Peter 5 and 8. We've already went over these. Be self-controlled and vigilant. That doesn't mean there's no time for exercise, fun, hanging out with friends, family, barbecues, or watching a good movie. You notice I said a, a good movie on TV. I was just talking to the, uh, the I already forgot the name of the school. <laughs> <What>? Thank you. <laughs> I'm telling you, I had too many concussions, man. <laughs> I was talking to the kids about that at school today. If you're sitting in a movie and you're hearing the Lord's name in vain be taken over and over and over and over again, should we continue to watch that movie? Well, I'm not going to ask you that, but I'm going to tell you right now, for me, I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Don't entertain that. Don't support things like that. That's what the Lord has told me. Our leisure time can be used in ways that please God by studying, meditating on his word, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study. study. Which one? And then you'll fill in where Pastor Jerry goes, thy word is truth, John 17.17. 17. Right? It's a flashback. I've been through discipleship so much. I'm not making fun of you. I love you, Pastor. You saved my life. You saved my life. And then Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. 
and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And by recuperating from life's busyness as Christ commanded his disciples in Mark 6.31, he said to them, come away by yourselves in a dissolute place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. Scripture also says that God provides us with material things for our enjoyment. That's right. He provides material things for our enjoyment. 1 Timothy 6, 17. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. But here is where it says their trust should be in who? God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. So he does provide material things for our what? Our enjoyment. I'm so grateful for that phrase because it allows me to spend reasonable time and money enjoying God's creation with, without guilt and doing things like running, mountain biking, hiking, kayaking. There's nothing more that I love to do than go out with my wife and go exploring somewhere, go backpacking somewhere. But while we're out there, what should we also be doing? Seeking God. So that person that's on the trail with me, or if I pass that runner on the trail with me, and I hear the Holy Spirit say, turn around, go back and tell that guy that I love him, guess what we need to do? Do that. Yesterday, I, uh, I think it was yesterday. Was it yesterday? My wife's like, I don't know what you do all day long. <laughs> yesterday, I had an opportunity to finally break in my new mountain bike. And I went out to Burheim Forest because people were telling me about the treetops. And I got up there. And yeah, it was awesome. I got to ride my mountain bike, but I also got a chance to sit quietly on the top of the mountain there, or I wouldn't call it a mountain, a hill, right? And break up my Bible and read some of the minor prophets that I haven't been able to read in quite some time. And then at once I, when, I, when I read it, closed it, and was able to sit there and meditate and pray for a while and just stop in a desolate place where no one is around and got to wait and listen to the voice of God tell something to me. So I got to enjoy what he gave me, and then I got to thank him for what? What he gave me, and it's time. Spend some time. So the answer isn't believing spending time doing things that we enjoy is automatically wrong. Hobbies and God-honoring entertainment, notice I say God-honoring entertainment, can be an enriching part of an abundant, satisfying, and joyful life. But leisure time can also weaken into hours of days of wasted watching mind-numbing television i can't tell you how many times i've uh, i've never been this guy I, I can't sit and watch tv for i don't know longer than 15 minutes if you ask my wife i'm either asleep or i got i got to get up and go <laughs> endless browsing of the internet and social media you get on this thing and you and the next thing you know you spent 45 minutes doing what looking at people slap each other on facebook you know, I, I'm telling you because guess what, who else is guilty of this? I am. Uh, internet, social media, indulging in fantasies, because once we start giving birth to sin, what starts to happen? And, and what I mean by sin is anything that you give over, uh, you, you put between you and God is what? You decide that. That's what I believe. But you start indulging in fantasies. Explicit romance novels. That turns into this and that turns into that. And then video games become your life. Have you ever seen those uh, movies or those videos where those guys are just so engulfed in a video game that when you take their controller from them, they bash the TV in? That's a little obsessive. Sin is hypnotizing and makes you stupid. Just ask Samson. I mean, he's laying there in bed, right? <laughs> Delilah's like, what makes you want to, you know, what makes you lose your strength? Oh, if you do this. And he tells her like three times. They come in and try to capture him, and then he tells her the truth. Sin makes you stupid. Because you just continue to live in it, right? And continue to believe that she's going to do something for you. <clears throat> My sister and I recently had a conversation about college football. Uh, college football is a pretty big deal in my family, but not to me. And I used to be one of the worst ones. Ask my wife. I was the first one to shout roll tide and, and run it in people's faces and all this stuff. But I'm here to tell you right now, I don't even know who the, the coach is anymore. I don't know who the offensive coordinator is anymore. I don't know who any of the players are on the team. And honestly, I don't care. And I don't mean that in a bad way. 
I just mean to tell you that I got other things to do in my life than focus my time on Alabama football. So my sister calls me up and she's, she's talking about it. And I just got down to it and I said, sis, I love you. I love you with everything I have, but I want to tell you something. I do not care if they lose every single football game next year. I don't care. And I told her, I said, I am tired of hearing and reading how people speak to each other over sporting events, over uh, music artists, and all this other stuff. We need to get away from that garbage and get back to where we're supposed to be spending time to. And whether that you choose to do that or not, that's, all, that's you. But that's, that's just what I feel. I, I can't participate in that anymore, and I told her that. Do I think there's anything wrong with watching a game? Absolutely not. I mean, I watched the Cubs lose the other day. No big deal, right? But I still can't tell you who was pitching. <laughs> so if our approach to free time is just television, it's always on because we're watching things, bringing uh, binge watching. We're likely neglecting other important things God has called us to do. So the question I have for you are, are you building relationships with your neighbors? And who are your neighbors? Anybody you come in contact with. Not just the person to your left and your right where you dwell, but anybody you come in contact with. And the people God has brought into your lives. Are we serving and reaching out to people? What great books are you reading? How deep are you going into reading and studying God's word? All these things can be... Uh, can bring great refreshment and joy. There's this uh, movie on Netflix called Time Changer, I believe is the name of it. can't remember the name of it now. And the guy's sitting in church next to this guy, and he, he's from the 1890s, but they, they time travel him into 1990 or the year 2000 just to kind of show him an experiment, right? So you can imagine going from 1890 to 2000 or what this guy saw. But he's sitting in church, and he's got his Bible in his hand, and he looks at the guy next to him and he says, so, what scripture have you been reading this week where the Lord has been speaking to you? And the guy looks at him from the, two th the year 2000 and he's like, what a whack job. And he walks away from him. Unfortunately, we see that today. Me and Isaiah saw that this week, didn't we? We went out and I talked to some people and, and a lady said something to me and I said, well, I talk and speak to God all the time. Matter of fact, on the way in the office, on the way out of the office, and on my way to my truck, guess what I'm going to be talking to? And she looked at us like, what? Like if we had something growing out of our foreheads. But yet she claimed to be a Christian. I don't condemn her for that, but we prayed, because that's what we're supposed to do. But just know that we need to be out there setting the example. Uh, when we're out and about and, and we're out talking to people, recruiting is what I tell. I hear people say, I don't have time to do a Bible study or go to class, etc. But, but they're actually spending time in their homes watching what? TV, scrolling on their phones and playing video games. I don't have time to go to first church tonight. I'm tired. So I'm going to go home and I'm going to watch TV. Guess what would bring you refreshment? Going and gathering with the body of Christ and hearing the word of God. That's what's going to bring refreshment. Not going home and sitting in your recliner on your cell phone and watching something on TV. Don't justify it either, because you can justify it. The enemy will come in and justify to you how you're spending your time to the point where you will believe him. Oh, that's right, I do need rest. You know what? Yeah, I do need to go to bed a little early. You know what? I don't need to go to first church. I already know that scripture. You can justify it any way possible and allow the enemy to do so. But he's just robbing your time. He might even say things to you. You don't need that class. You already read Matthew. You've already read Mark. You've already read Luke, John. There was another time in the Bible when people didn't have time. It was the great feast. I think, uh, next slide, please. Thank you, brother. That'll work. It's just too, too small. I apologize. In the Gospel of Luke, we read of a man who planned a great feast and invited many people. When it was time to serve dinner, they were all too busy. One with his farm, one with his bride, another with his oxen. When did we become so busy making a living that we forgot how to make a life? God gets crowded out of our lives over the most unimportant things. When Jesus was born, the end didn't have room for him. Today, we still don't have room for Jesus. 
We crowd them out with so many things. Has anyone ever read the book, The Screw Tape Letters? <clears throat> I'm going to tell you right now, I, should, I believe with everything I hold dear, if you're new to Christianity, if you're old to Christianity, you need to read The Screw Tape Letters. When I first gave my life to Christ, my mother-in-law called me up, and she told me, she said, you need to read this book called The Screw Tape Letters. It scared me to death. Because everything in that book was talking about me and the way I used to look at things. In the screw tape letter, C.S. Lewis shows how the devil captures us, not by preventing encounters with God, but by worshiping in our ears that we're just too busy right now. What we need to do is, is we need to reset our priorities. You've heard Pastor Jerry say this many times. What should be our priorities? God, God, God. Some people will look at you and say, well, you can't do that. You have to go to work. God, God, God. And it's just like a friend walked up to me one day and he says, Freddie, it comes down to do we truly believe the scripture where it says if you seek the kingdom first, all will be added. Chancellor talked to me uh, a couple weeks ago and told me, I didn't get any work done today because for three hours I spent time ministering to someone who had questions about God. And I told Chancellor, I said, you did work three hours. You put in some well-needed hours. You can get the plumbing done later. But the important work was done. That's the important part. Just as we budget our finances, resources to reflect our priorities, we can reset our allocation of time. We are all busy, but not all that busy. We may need to say no to certain demands of our time, opening our schedule up to God, prompting we can live each day anticipating the opportunities he places on our path to offer our gift of time. So we have to ask ourselves, what kind of a person will all these things make me? Studying the word of God. Worshiping, prayer. Uh, over the years, I didn't know that I was supposed to tithe. I didn't know uh, about offerings. I didn't even know about stewardship of time. I still remember coming home one day, and I didn't grow up in church. I don't know anything about it. Didn't all I knew that I just all I knew about church is I wanted to get as far away from church people as possible. That's all I knew. Well, <laughs> thank God He sent me here, and I was able to not. Uh, just listen to the word, but someone taught me how to apply the word to my life. So now I tell my wife, I say, uh, when we do things, here's my simple rule. Uh, when I think about my time, or when I think about our time, when I think about our finances, and how I will spend it, <clears throat> I ask one simple question How will this affect the kingdom? If it affects the kingdom, then we do not buy it. If it affects the kingdom with our time, then we do not do it. It's simple. I don't want to rob the kingdom of God of anything that he has given to me. I want to use his assets that he gave me the, wise, the wisest way I can. And I expect my wife to speak into my life when I do something stupid, right, babe? <clears throat> I encourage you guys to take these sheets up here that I have for you, and to keep track of how you spend your time for one week. When you do this, you, might, you must keep track of every minute, no time gaps. See where your time is being spent, and for you guys who are taking this for credit, you will take this sheet, and you will fill it out, and you will get, be a, accountable for your time. My wife is loving this part right now, just want to let you know. I did it for you, baby. I want to spend my money wisely towards your education. <clears throat> Under how, understanding how we speak, uh, uh, spend our time it makes us better stewards because we become aware of uh, the things we would normally become aware of. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move through some things pretty quickly here. Uh, like, for instance, I want to spend more time reading some great books. I want to spend some more time, like I just picked up uh, a, another great book in the mail the other day called The Carpenter, or Not Just a Carpenter. Uh, I want to spend some time reading that. I want to spend some time every single day in one of the books of the Bible reading it, studying it, 
I want to spend some time in a class back here learning more and more that I can. I want to spend some time reading to my grandkids. Jessica just got a new children's Bible, uh, and it's, it's, it's marine-like, too, because it's got two words on the page and lots of pictures. So we like books like that. Me and David get along great when I read these books. But I get to talk to him, and I go, this is the guy that you were named after because this is your daddy's favorite character in the Bible, David. I want to spend some time with my wife. I want to reduce electronics in my life. If it wasn't for group me, I would throw my phone away. <laughs> but that wouldn't be obedient to uh, leadership, would it? But one day I dream about not having a cell phone. One day I dream about saying to everyone, call Jessica. She'll know where I'm at. Don't allow the thief to steal, kill, and destroy your time. Fill it with ease. Next slide, I'm going to move quickly now. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, okay, we're there. Okay, go back. Prayer. Prayer means to seek communion with God and enter into that 1 John 5 and 14 dialogue. You might want to write some of these scriptures down because I'm not going to have a lot of time to, uh, to read them out to you. Taking time to pray helps you grow in your relationship with God. There may be periods in your lives where you don't feel like praying. Who's ever had that before? Where you don't feel like praying? Right, Beth? There's been many times that I've just been at my wit's end, Beth. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. But I, there's a scripture that comes to my mind that says, when you don't know what the words to pray, the Spirit will pray for you. And right away, that tells me that what I need to do is just fall on my face. And whatever comes out, comes out. It does not matter. But just fall on my face and pray and connect with my Father. I know sometimes, I know my neighbors probably think I'm crazy because I get up at 4.30 every single morning. I can't help it. It's just been embedded in me. I've tried to sleep in. It doesn't work. I don't sleep as it is. But I get up and I walk my dogs, and as I'm walking my dogs, I'm praying over our whole neighborhood, everywhere we go. And I'm sure they're like, man, there's that crazy dude out there again, walking his dogs. That's okay. I might be crazy, but I'm praying for you, brother. So call me any name you want. Apart from our daily structured time, we need to spend in prayer. Uh, our thoughts may frequently go to God during our day, practicing the presence. Brother Lawrence talks about this in his book, in Discipleship 3, practicing his presence. We also practice his presence in every man of warrior, cultivating holy beauties, when we learn to do our one-on-one -on -one and break the verses down and get into the Word of God. Romans 12, 12, 1 John 5, 14 and 15, and, and uh, Daniel 6, 11. These are just some scripture references for you. I'm running out of time. Reading scripture. We need to take the time to read scripture regularly. Joshua 1, 8, at least once a day. What does Joshua 8, uh, 1, 8 say? Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. So you be careful to do everything written in it so you will be prosperous and successful. Meditate day and night on the word of God. Witnessing, taking time to share our faith and benefits for others. For they have a chance to get to know Jesus and understand the scripture in a deeper way. We too are blessed because speaking about God helps us deepen our relationship with him. There's a little girl that may be showing up to church this, uh, this Sunday. Her name is Mia. And her baby's name is Nugget, is what she referred to him as. She came out of the library. Me and Isaiah caught her. We asked her. We did nothing. We just asked her, how you doing? How's your life? What's going on? Can we pray for you? Can we lay hands on you? And then she said, I'm looking for a church. Well, it just so happens that we know of a church down the road. Do they have daycare? Absolutely. Service. Part of a Christian life includes serving others, family, friends. Matt, uh, Matthew 27, 36 to 39 tells us about serving our neighbors. I, I spoke about this a couple Sundays ago. If you ever feel like you're overwhelmed and the enemy is attacking you, stop worrying about yourself and go serve in the kingdom. You will immediately forget about all your circumstances and be blessed because you're serving somebody else. <clears throat> Some scripture uh, to, to refer on that one is Luke 10, 25 through 37, Matthew 5 and 7, Matthew 22, 37 and 39. Fellowship, fellowship, fellowship. Time spent with believers is very important. Typically, we are stronger together than we are alone. We find support and encouragement in Christian fellowship, and our faith strengthens. We can also be a blessing to our brothers and sisters. 
instead of sitting at home watching TV, get up, go visit someone. There's plenty of people in our church that are sick, not feeling, so, uh, feeling good, and need encouragement. Sister Carolyn Cox needs encouragement, right? Go knock on her door. Say hi. Brother and Sister Payne will never turn you away. He will always tell me about get in, get out, or get ran over. That's what he tells me every sermon should be about. Okay? And, and the list goes on and on. Go over to Sean and Michaela's house. They're not doing anything. <laughs> Worshiping. <laughs> you guys are the busiest people I know. I sit at home some things and go, man, good Lord, bless them, Lord. They have so many children that they don't even know about. <laughs> worshiping, this is an essential part of my day. Uh, it's an opportunity to get alone with God and turn on some worship music and fall on my face and raise my hands. Uh, Homer Purdy, in the book we read, uh, The Way of the Worshiper, he says, Worship doesn't lead to the presence of God. Face-to-face -face encounter uh, with him is just a church concert. I can tell you right now, the worship team at Bethesda, make sure that it's not a concert. Pastor Sean has said on numerous occasions that if he could, he would just turn his back and play that way. Because we all should be worshiping. It's not a who's talent, who can sing this and who can sing that. It's about worshiping and glory to God. And these are just a few things that I've included. Uh, you, there's so many more things that you can fill your time with. So here's my conclusion for tonight. Go ahead. Two minutes over. I apologize, guys. One of the most precious gifts we have received from God is time. We belong to God, and our time also belongs to Him. We are asked to use this gift in productive ways. God has also given us guiding principles about how to do this in a faithful, as faithful stewards. By following these principles, our lives are enriched and glorify God. We also demonstrate that we are completely committed to the Lord, and that He, in turn, will guide us into a deeper understanding of Him, and his plan. Stop making it about yourself, Freddie Allen Jones, and make it about him, his plan. If you continually seek money in this world and seek to get rich and fame and all that stuff, you will die a poor man. And I'm not talking about the money in your bank because that don't mean nothing. You will die a poor man. I had a career where I spent a majority of my time away from home. And I look at Jessica every single day, and I tell her, I say, I, I miss those times of watching my boys grow up. But you know what? Where I was in my life, I would have squandered that time away because it wasn't based on God. We have got to turn our attention to the Lord and stop turning our attentions to worldly things. So the takeaway from this class, I challenge you to examine your time. Where are you at? Where are you spending your time at? And that's it. Questions? Comments? All right, five minute break. All right. Well, as I put you to sleep here, Pastor Jerry will wrap it up after me and get you guys moving again. So that'll be that'll be a plus for the night. All right, tonight we're gonna talk about the temple and stewarding the temple. Okay, stewardship, basically primarily denoted as the manager of a household or a state. So just to cover that, I wasn't sure if it was gonna get covered, so I put that in there so that we just had a clear idea of what stewardship was. <clears throat> so stewardship is making full use of what we have been given from God with contentment, full willingness, and submission for His glory. What is the temple? The temple is a shrine, that part of a temple where God himself resides. Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Also, therefore, having these promises... Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. So in short, we are the temple. Okay. Sorry, I'm 
juggling between the two here, so I need to make sure I'm on track here. So we've probably seen this before. If you haven't, this is the comparison. Uh, God works in threes. You have the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We have body, soul, and spirit as human beings, and we mimic the temple as the outer court, which is the flesh, the inner court, and the holy of holies. So humans, of course, are body, soul, and spirit. The temple is the outer court, or the bodily or physical dimension. The holy place, or the inner court, uh, is the soul or the mental, emotional dimension. And the holy of holies is the spiritual, communal dimension. I'll call it also the most holy place uh, in some parts of this. So I'm going to read Psalm 139. Uh, just take a second, but I think it's important. I was wanting to just use the basic thing about being knit, knit together or knit in your uh, mother's womb. But um, as I read before and behind it, um, I just thought it necessary to read the whole thing. <clears throat> so, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I am far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. <clears throat> you know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the farthest oceans, even there, <clears throat> your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. <clears throat> to you the night shines as bright as the day, darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. <clears throat> they outnumber the grains of the sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. O oh God, if you would destroy the wicked, get out of my life, you murderers. They blaspheme you. Your enemies misuse your name. O oh Lord, shouldn't I hate those who hate you? Shouldn't I despise those who oppose you? Yes, I hate them with total hatred, for your enemies are my enemies. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you, and lead me along the path of life everlasting. So anybody here that thinks that they are not worth something or a mistake or could have done something better. That's a lie from the enemy. Y'all are made exactly how God made you to be. Every, every part of you is how God intended you to be. So God knows all and is all. We are to steward our lives from the start because he knew us from the start. Nothing about us is an accident or mistake. To say so makes him a liar. Am I happy about my hair or my pain or my tendency to sin? No, but that is my lot, and I'm called to look past the physical. That doesn't matter anyway. And to look towards the eternal, daily laying aside my thoughts and sins that hold me back from his plan and purpose. David makes it clear that we know nothing. Let me see that. I'm sorry. David makes it clear that nothing we say or do can escape the Lord. Our thoughts, our desires, our intentions... Everything we think is hidden is known to him, and none of us are clever enough to fool him. He is all-knowing. Okay, the body defined, the physical body that we have. So the physical structure of a person or an animal, including the bones, flesh, and organs. Job calls it a house of clay, Job 419. Now, there are scripture references here. Um, Isaiah and Paul both call it a tent. Mark and Paul call it a temple or a tabernacle, and Paul also calls it the dust of the earth and jars of clay. Our bodies roll in salvation. Your body must submit as a vessel of honor. It must be out of the way so our spirit can answer the call of the Holy Spirit and join our spirit back to God. Romans 8.16 says, For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are his children. Do we, our flesh, naturally want to submit to God's spirit? 
so that our body, soul, and spirit come into submission to God's plan for our lives? No, our flesh wants what it wants, and it wants it now. This is truly a miracle of God getting us to wholly submit to Christ and follow him in his ways. Okay, the body on sanctification. As we become more sanctified in our bodies, our bodies become more and more useful servants of God, more and more responsive to the will of God and the desires of the Holy Spirit. We will not let sin reign in our bodies, nor allow our bodies to participate in any way in immorality, but will treat our bodies with care and will recognize that they are the means by which the Holy Spirit works through us in this life. Therefore, they are not to be recklessly abused or mistreated, but they are to be made useful and able to respond to God's will. And that's apart from Grudem's uh, book of theology, the big blue one, for those that know there's several of them. <laughs> so that one's a lot more detailed. Okay, <clears throat> dishonoring the temple. Don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say, the two are united into one, 1 Corinthians 6.16. They exchange, and here's another example. They exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the cre creature rather than the creator, who is forever worthy of praise. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to dishonorable passions. Even the women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. Likewise, the men abandoned natural relations with women and burned for lust with one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error, Romans 1, 25 through 17. And there are more examples, but these are just a couple of the more extreme examples uh, of the, uh, the physical and spiritual results of sin. I think that's pretty profound. When I read that, when I was more uh, aware as a believer and how um, it talks about that with homosexuality, and if you look at that, you see it today. I mean, it's the diseases have names today, you know, and here Paul talks about the same thing. So it's just, it's remarkable how nothing is new under the sun. All right, so dishonoring the temple, just something to keep in mind. Uh, old song, I'm sure some of y'all may know it. Be careful, little eyes, what you see, little ears, what you hear, little mouth, what you say, little hands, what you do, little feet, where you go, little heart, whom you trust. There's a father up above, and he's looking down in love. So always be aware of how we could be bringing dishonor to our bodies. Remember, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Uh, Jesus took it a step further by making our hearts and thoughts a central part of this dishonoring process. Sorry, as, you know, as far as he went and saying how, um, you know, if you hate someone and you, if you don't murder, that's, that's great. You know, nobody should murder. But if you hate somebody in your heart, that's the first step. And they've been talking about that in church the last couple weeks. That's that, that little seed that's planted. And after that, it's up to you. I mean, it would be up to you to commit murder on that hate. But take your thoughts captive, cast them down, and put God first. still on dishonoring the temple <clears throat> young people it's wonderful to be young and i like this translation this is the new living translation of uh, ecclesiastes young people it's wonderful to be young enjoy every minute of it do everything you want to do take it all in and i highlighted this youngsters even us old people it's it's all the same remember though you must give an account to god for everything you do so refuse to worry keep your body healthy but remember that youth with the whole life before you is meaningless so all this, this stuff you see nowadays, I mean, it's, it's live as fast as you can. Um, everything, everybody's searching for something. They're searching for likes. They're searching for approval. If they would just understand that they wouldn't have to look any further than the one who loves us, the one who created us. And then they would understand that purpose, how we were knit in our, in our mother's wombs and Everything is just perfect for his plan. Um, 
Our physical bodies and natural appetites were created by God and are not sinful in themselves. Nevertheless, if left uncontrolled, we will find our bodies becoming instruments of wickedness rather than instruments of righteousness. And that's from Jerry Wrigley. Okay. Whatever increases the strength and authority of your body over your mind, that thing is sin to you. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and not do it. James 4, 17. Each person is responsible for their actions. We used this example in the, the men's squall, small group once. I know it was an extreme example, but, and I think as a church we're pressing toward this. I've heard it several times, and I think it's being driven home even harder now. So uh, it's no secret that everything is individual, right? I think I used the example. If I brought, who was it? I don't know. Let's. Was it Christian or Kyle? I don't know. If I brought them drugs, right, to you and handed it off to them and said, hey, man, here's some, here's some drugs. That's my sin, right? He's not sinning if he takes it and throws it away. If he takes it and uses it, that makes it his sin at that point. I'm responsible for bringing sin down upon him. But what he chooses to do with what I offer is where the sin or not becomes his responsibility and if he doesn't do anything with it then that's that's a reward for you you know well done good and faithful servant right so um our lives our salvation everything we have is individual i know we've heard it before that you know, family can't get you to heaven your your elders bishops Pope, whatever, it doesn't matter. You're not getting to heaven through them. If you, haven't, if you haven't made an individual decision to accept Christ as your Savior, then you're not saved. You can be here every Sunday. You can be here every time the doors are open, helping set up chairs and take seminars and classes and all that stuff. But individually, if your heart isn't right, you've got to make it right. Hate to see any of y'all not make it. Uh, before Christ, we had a two-step process. Your thoughts, your will, your soul, which was born to sin, made a request. Then the, let, me, let me back that up so it makes more sense. Before Christ, we had a two-step process. Your thoughts, which is your will or your soul, which was born to sin, made a request. Then the body followed, depending on the convictions and upbringing, or possibly fear of punishment. So if you were afraid to take the drugs because you were afraid that you know your parents might punish you or you might get caught by the law that's that's a pretty good reason you would probably refrain from it at that point but if you chose to do it then you're giving in the temptations of the flesh which had no spiritual connection at this point because you know on this scenario or they're not saved so before we're saved we have a body and a soul and a spirit laying dormant so we have a a, a battle essentially of what we know, and I'm going to cover it here in a minute, but, uh, well, later on down, the, down the, the course, because it says that God's law is written on everybody's heart, but it's what you do with it. Uh, so now, let's see. Uh, now, as believers, our spirit, through the Holy Spirit, is quickened to do something, then our soul, which is prone to sin, must make a decision to ignore the request or the will, the body, to accomplish what God is leading us to do. So we have been given a check valve for what we know is sin. The will can stop, the will can still operate independently, but that check, the Holy Spirit, will convict us to change our direction. The beauty in this system God put in place is that even <clears throat> if we turn towards the desires of our bodies, we have a way out. God's word says it, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The temptations of your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, <clears throat> he will show you a way out so you can endure. So if you're about to do something stupid and your mom calls, hey, uh, what are you doing? Uh, well, uh, nothing. Yeah, you were about to mess up. So God, he provides a way of escape. When you hang that call up, you can go do whatever you were going to do. But that break, that separation between that time where you could have executed, he sent a, 
that check valve. He sent that ability to escape from the sin. It's not going to happen necessarily by a phone call, but there's always a way out, okay? And that could also come through what? Conviction. Holy Spirit convicting you. Okay, the physical body. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what I should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others that I myself might be disqualified. That's Paul speaking. It's certainly not me. So. Um, exercise is essential, or physical exercise is essential. But in Bible times, work, transportation, which is mostly by foot, and diet have provided most of the necessities for basic fitness and health. Today, our society is so stagnant, we require a segment of time for our da uh, daily exercise, which can be a distraction that hinders our spiritual uh, stewardship by robbing us of our time. It's possible, too, that this fitness can turn from health to vanity quickly. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says what we should do. We look not at things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The body will perish, so we, the bo this body will perish, so we should be building upon things that are eternal. However, fitness is necessary for the discipline of our bodies. The body does not like or want pain, exhaustion, or denial of its cravings. So for any progress to move forward physically, our bodies must submit to what our mind or will has to say. So as Paul says here, we are to discipline our bodies. Think of our bodies as a child. If we fail to discipline our children, they will run laps around you as they grow older. They'll disrespect you, they'll dishonor you, and they'll bring bitterness and grief. If we don't discipline our bodies, it will drag us into ruin and grief. Think of the bad decisions we have made that can't be undone. If we would have submitted to the Lord rather than our flesh, we would have saved ourselves so much pain. This is why keeping our bodies disciplined is good for stewarding our lives. We have one body for this life. <clears throat> the decisions we make throughout our lives can determine the quality of life we will have as it gets older. Okay. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and the life to come. So here Paul is letting Timothy know the importance of maintaining our bodies, but preparing for the eternal should, be a, should hold a priority. Nothing goes with us. Nails, extensions, enhancements, nothing. It will all look silly someday if someone digs that up. We will be perfect in our new bodies. No work we put in on this earth will compare to how perfect and glorious we will appear. So stop chasing vanity. It's like chasing the wind. Rest is something else required for a healthy body. Uh, I couldn't find many references and benefits of sleep, so I'm not really going to talk about it too long. But we should be good stewards of our sleep. It's been given to us for rest and recovery from these days of toiling. There are many ideas of how, how much we need, uh, gadgets that measure our, our peak sleep cycles and natural chemical and sleep aids. Each person is unique to whether they need eight hours to function or four. Uh, so we should decide that for ourselves. But to stay up late, to wake up early, dragging all day, we should evaluate how we are stewarding our gift of rest in our lives. All right, <clears throat> food and drink. So I decided there was nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and find satisfaction in work. Then I realized these pleasures are from the hand of God. God gave us these <clears throat> to offer some pleasure from our struggling on this earth. We're absolutely not an ag agricultural generation. Even the farmers shop for their food. So we need to steward our food choices to maximize the effectiveness and longevity of our temples. I can debate the, deba the dangers of even the most natural foods all day, but I'm not going to. I know our food supply is tainted. This is why we should have faith in all things, our food, our digestion, and the distribution throughout our body included. Pray over your food. Be thankful. This helps exercise the faith because you are calling it out and acknowledging that only God can purify all areas of our lives. We could spend the rest of our time recalling verses regarding gluttony and drunkenness, so I will only highlight a couple. Okay. Be not among the drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and slumber will clothe them with rags. 
destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Here's a long one I had to squeeze in here. Hopefully I can see it. Well, I guess you can't see it yet. There you go. All right. So this one's, I mean, how much more detail can you get for those who have ever experienced this? So who has anguish? Who has sorrow? Who is always fighting? Who is always complaining? Who, is, who has unnecessary bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? It is the one who spends long hours in the taverns, trying out new drinks. Don't gaze at the wine, seeing how red it is, how it sparkles in the cup, how smoothly it goes down. For in the end, it bites like a poisonous snake. It stings like a viper. You will see hallucinations, and you will say crazy things. You will stagger like a sailor tossed at sea, clinging to a swaying mast. <clears throat> And you will say, they hit me, but I didn't feel it. And I didn't even know when they beat me up. When will I wake up so I can look for another drink? And that's, that's really a sad state. Uh, my dad was an alcoholic. Um, I don't remember too much of it. He hit it really well. Um, but I could imagine him going through parts of his life like this. You know what I'm saying? Like how, how sad that is that you, that's, that's what you live for. You know, that's, that's painful. That just God's a deliverer in that. That's, that's, that's what I love about him. So this shows what to look for in a drunkard. The attractions the drink has to the drunkard and the effects and after effects alcohol has on the person. These verses alone should be enough to keep us clear of excess drinking. But how do we avoid the temptation of excess? By avoiding it altogether. Glad you're here, Chancellor. I got one for you. So laziness leads to a sagging roof, idleness to a leaky house. That one hurts a little because I have several unfinished projects that could stand some attention at the house. Um, so that was, I almost didn't want to put that one down. But. <laughs> so here we go. As the door swings back and forth on its hinges, so the lazy person turns over in bed and go ahead, Chancellor. There we go. I should have turned it off because I know you have it memorized. Uh, okay, so in Matthew, and this lines up with what Pastor Fred had talked about, in Matthew 25, 14 through 29, the parable of the bags of gold, Jesus tells a story of a lazy servant. We are to be busy about the work of the kingdom. Laziness affects the body, its abilities, and the gifts we have been given to steward. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. How can we recover from our idleness? It's not a rhetorical question. Let's see. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all. Let's see, did I get that, you guys? I'm sorry. I'm not a juggler. I've never been able to. So, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, work with it at all your heart as if working for the Lord and not for human masters. I, I don't know how that verse stuck to me uh, early on in my walk, but youngsters going into the workforce, even, even y'all still in it, take that verse. Whatever you do, do it as work at it with all your heart, work as if working for the Lord, not human masters, because that's the truth. You're going to find joy in what you do if you use that verse as your foundation when you go to work. Right. You might not like what you do, but you're going to find joy in, in your work if you stick to that verse. I, I can guarantee you. I don't promise, but I can guarantee you. Okay, so more of our faculties here. Okay, <clears throat> stewarding the body, your eyes, your ears, your mouth. Specifically, our eyes and mouth. Again, for the sake of time, I will cover a few of these. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must be, all be quick to, quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to get angry. We were given two ears and one mouth for a reason. James says, among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It's a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. A small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. Even though the winds are strong, in the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. 
People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It's restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our, the Lord our Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. I like how he added that at the end of it. That's, uh, it's actually kind of profound. He could have left it right there, but he assures us that it is not a good thing that we're doing by doing that. So we must choose to control our tongues and speak life. Remember when it comes to your body, you are created in God's image, and the enemy hates that. He does all he can to appeal to your flesh and to your emotions. Some modern examples of this, and don't, you know, don't throw anything at me. It's just, it's how I see it. And um, I'm going to try and give a perspective, even that, you know, that way. Because there's, and we've talked about this also. It's kind of neat how everything's lining up. But there's good and evil. There's no gray, right? There's good and evil. And very soon, I think, the world's going to come to a, a a realization of that they're going to have to make a choice and it's not going to be just go live my life and do whatever i think there's going to come a a point of decision in this <coughs> world where a decision will have to be made there can't be turning a blind eye to evil and calling it good anymore it's going to be satanic or it's going to be of god so um i hope i can shed a light on this so that it's it's not targeted. I mean, if it's something that's, that is that in your life, then conviction goes a long way. Change it. Take it to God. But, and again, this is, I mean, it's not extreme. It's just something that, that I, I think about. So some modern examples of um, things the enemy hates and wants your, your flesh over your spirit is uh, in the service industry. So how can we exalt the body how else can you exalt the body over the spirit than through massages, manicures, pedicures, fitness, salon visits, just to name a few? Uh, they're not bad in and of themselves, but left without consideration, vanity and pleasing our senses can quickly take root. All I'm saying is that there's more to the world's targeting of the body than meets the eye. The farther the enemy can take you from your spirit and focus on your flesh, the, the more he's winning. So just if you take part in these things, again, in and of themselves are not bad, but evaluate why you're taking part in these things. Okay. Okay, the eyes. Speaking of eyes, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Then the light in you is darkness. How great is the darkness? We can almost leave it here, but there are two more verses uh, out of dozens regarding the eyes. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. So many worthless things to look at nowadays. Wow, it's overwhelming, actually. I made a covenant with my eyes to not look with lust at a young woman. Job 31.1. All right, and after a brief bit there on our faculties, I'm going to go to the end here. So, give me a second, I need to find that. All right, so we, we have to prepare for our decline as well. As a temple, our temple is going to fade away, right? So we have to prepare for that also. So I've said for years, there are two things you can count on uh, the second you're born. God's love will never change and death will come to us all. Solomon tells us here not to forget that date we will have with our Creator. Live a life that honors Him. Don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your Creator. Honor Him in your youth before you grow old and say, life is not pleasant anymore. Remember Him before the light of the sun, moon, and stars is dim to your old eyes, and rain clouds continually darken your sky. Remember Him before your legs, the guards of your house, start to tremble. And before your shoulders, the strong men stoop. Remember him before your teeth, your few remaining servants stop grinding. And before your eyes, the woman looking through the windows see dimly. Remember him before the door of life's opportunity is closed and the sound of work fades. 
Now you will rise at the first chirping of the birds, and all their sounds will grow faint. Remember him before you become fearful of falling and worry about dangers in, st in the streets. Before your hair turns white like an almond tree in bloom, you will drag along without energy like a dying grasshopper, and the capybara no longer inspires sexual desire. Remember him before you, before you near the grave, your everlasting home, when the mourners will weep at your funeral. Yes, remember your creator now while you are young. Before the silver cord of light snaps and the golden bowl is broken, don't wait until the jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well, for the dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Solomon was a wise man. I'm not going to break into the, the details of the silver cord and the bowl and the, the well and all that stuff. That's for a whole other day. You can ask later if, you, if you're curious. Okay, now on to the soul. Your soul is the, I guess, the holy place, the inner court of the temple. <clears throat> So sanctification, growth and sanctification will affect our emotions. We will see increasingly in our lives emotions such as love, joy, peace, patience. We will be able to increasingly obey Peter's command to abstain from the passions of the flesh that wage war against your soul. We will find it increasingly true that we do not love the world or the things of this world, but that we, like our Savior, delight to do God's will. In an ever-increasing measure, we become obedient from the heart, Romans six seventeen. And we will put away the negative emotions involved in bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander. Moreover, sanctification will have an effect on our will, our decision-making faculty, because God is at work in us to will and to work for his good pleasure. As we grow in sanctification, our will will be more and more conformed to the will of our Heavenly Father. Another one from Grudem. I have one for the soul from him also, or the spirit also. Okay, the soul defined. Very similar to spirit. Vines defines it as, it denotes breath, the breath of life. Then the soul, in its various meanings, New Testament uh, uses, may be analyzed approximately as follows. A natural life of the body, the material invisible part of a man, the disembodied, the seed of personality, the seed of the sin sentient, sentient sorry, element in the man by which he perceives, reflects, feels, desires, the seat of will and purpose, the seat of appetite, persons, and individuals. This is the part of us that will experience the joys of heaven or the weeping and gnashing of teeth of hell. The way we think or feel here on earth will be amplified in our new bodies. The pleasure of making it into the kingdom or the terror that will never die rest on our decision to believe in Christ through faith. All right, the will, our soul, ultimately makes each individual choice of whether we will sin or obey. It is the will that chooses to yield to temptation or to say no. Our wills then ultimately determine our moral destiny, whether we will be holy or unholy in our character and conduct. Another one from Jerry Bridges. Uh, Alistair Begg says, So a thought reap an action, so an action reap a habit, so a habit reap a character, so a character reap a destiny. Okay, influence of the soul. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you used to walk when you were confronted in the ways of the world and the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit who, now, who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. All of us lived among them at one time, fulfilling the cravings of the flesh and indulging in the desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature children of wrath. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. They are darkened in their understanding and alienated, alienated from the life of God because of ignorance that is due them in the hardness of their hearts. Ephesians 4.18 <clears throat> Even Gentiles who do not have, and this is what I was talking about earlier, even the Gentiles who do not have God, God's written law show they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written on their hearts, for, it's, for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they're doing right. That's in Romans 2, 14 to 15. There's so much hope for us in that verse because it's deeply rooted in truth. We have a definite ability to manage our will for the Lord. Whether we know it or not, <clears throat> we have done this as children. If we wanted to do something and we knew it was wrong in our hearts, 
we would hide or sneak off and do it. Or our, our will was controlling the flesh and its embarrassment. This is what Paul was alluding to in the verse, we all know right from wrong, but our decisions reflect where our hearts are. When we become believers, our decisions are backed and influenced by our now connected spirit. Okay, controlling our will. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. The Bible mostly speaks to us through our reason, which is <clears throat> it's necessary to remain in the word, so we can be pure brides of Christ, washed by the water of the word. Cast down arguments <clears throat> and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. There's a thought again. That's part of your, your emotional and your will and soul. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God, Romans 12, 2. These verses are only a few regarding how we are to control ourselves. All give us a role to play in the process, a choice we have to make. Do we choose righteousness or sin? Only you are able to make this decision. But it uses words like get rid of, cast down, think about. James 4, 7 says to resist. So this is not a passive battle we're in. We don't have the luxury of being on the defense. We have to know our enemy and how he operates. He operates through our desires. Paul tells Timothy, flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, together with all those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 2 Timothy 2.22 but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and, he will, and on his law he meditates on it day and night. Psalm 1, 2. So what's next? I know you can't see that, but sure. Just to help you out, that's Proverbs 2, 1 through 12. Solomon tells us, My child, listen to what I say. Treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom. And concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord, and you will gain knowledge, gain knowledge of God. For the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth come <clears throat> knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. He guards the path of the just. He protects those who are faithful to him. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, and you will find the, the right way to go. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will fill you with joy. Wise choices will watch over you. Understanding will keep you safe. Wisdom will save you from evil people, from those whose words are twisted. Proverbs 2, 1 through 12. Again, here we cannot be passive. It says to ask, seek, concentrate, listen, cry out, search out the scriptures daily, feast on them, <clears throat> then you will find yourself exercising your thoughts for God's glory and taking the desires that rise up in us captive. We are responsible to tell our will that God's word is in, our, is in control of our thoughts and actions. Okay, finally on spirit. Sanctification will also affect our spirit, the non-physical part of our beings. We are to cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body <clears throat> and spirit and make holiness perfect in, fear of the, in the fear of God, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. And Paul says that a concern about the affairs of the Lord will mean taking those, taking thought for how to be holy in body and spirit. Sorry. <laughs> Starting to, all the words are bleeding together right now. Okay, the spirit defined, similar to soul. Wind, breath, exhalation, life, anger. Uh, where am I? Yeah. Uns 
substantiality, a re region of the sky, a spirit. Then the Lord God had formed the man of the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Genesis 2, 7. The spirit appears similar <clears throat> to the soul in its explanation here. But at the start of life, Adam was given a spirit that communed with God, along with a natural soul and obviously a body. When Adam sinned, he forfeited his right to that communion with the Lord in the most holy place, his spirit. That connection was lost, and only Christ could restore that connection through his death, burial, and resurrection, leaving the Holy Spirit to take up residence in those who would receive him, who would receive his baptism at and after Pentecost. Our spirit lays dormant until the indwelling of the Holy Spirit comes in and fills those who receive him. Okay, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is taking up residence in our most holy place. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not much heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, And to what were you baptized? And they answered, And to John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying that the people should believe on him who should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were <clears throat> baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. <clears throat> it says that these men were disciples, right? So we can all agree they were believers. Okay. So John's baptism of repentance as believers... We all had to go through that as a process of repentance. So what are we missing? The baptism and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. There's a common occurrence with this baptism. Uh, if you follow that verse on past Acts 19, 1 and 6, and there's Stephen, uh, several others, um, there's a common occurrence. And after the tongues, you have the baptism, tongues follow, but so does preaching with boldness, authority, and understanding, which amazes even the religious leaders of the time. So I said that to say this, if we are to steward our whole temple, we have to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in the most holy place, guiding and directing our steps. Intercession. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of god romans 8 26 and 27 <clears throat> holy spirit helps us intercede on our behalf and on behalf of others we can try all we can to pray for ourselves and others but who better to intercede for us than the one who knew me before the foundations of the earth were laid so why discount such a weapon things to avoid all these attitudes <clears throat> okay sorry <laughs> take a try my all these attitudes envy jealousy bitterness and unforgiving and retaliatory spirit and critical and gossiping spirit defile us and keep us from being holy before god they are just as evil as immorality drunkenness, drunkenness and debauchery therefore we must work diligently at rooting out these sinful attitudes from our minds none of these build us up as build build up us or the body none of these build us up or the body of believers they separate us from god requ requiring repentance for our sinful actions and thoughts things to pursue but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control against such things there is no law galatians 5 22 and 23 i don't know where this came from but i had to use it i doctored it a little bit but I thought it was very, very nice. So, okay, there you go. Perfect. The other one was not. So love heads the list because God is love. 1 John 4, 7 and 21. Love is the most important out of these nine. Without it, our good works have no use on earth. Joy. Joy goes deeper than mere happiness, says Ellicott's com commentary. Joy comes from the radiance and brightness of God himself. In such a presence of brightness, we can experience comfort during difficult trials. Peace goes hand in hand with his attribute. Peace extends to others and our inner selves. 
Love, joy, and peace appear to go together. It shows our relationship with God. When we spend time with God, we are full of love, full of heavenly joy, and full of peace. The next three, according to McLaurin's exposition, get lumped into a triad, patience, kindness, and goodness. These especially manifest themselves in our relationship with others, opposed to the first three showing up more in our relationship with God. Instead of choosing to retaliate, we endure sufferings and we choose to love others. We refuse to add to the, we refuse to add to the fire of antagonism. Our final triad is gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, which refers to how we handle opposition. When we face temptation or other temptation or people who attempt to sway us from righteous living or from Christ Himself, we lean on these three virtues. That's the last slide there. So we must steward our lives, body, soul, and spirit, so we can endure the fight the enemy brings to us every day we wake up. These are a few aspects of our lives that we have to keep in check with God's word and in worship and in communion with him. We have to be sure to allow the Holy Spirit to do the work within us. Therefore, we must receive the Holy Spirit for who he is so that it is not just with us in salvation, but dwelling within us in our most holy place through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's that, I believe. Yep. I think it's uh, good to realize that when we talk about biblical stewardship, we're talking about more than money. God's calling us to steward our whole lives. Everything about us, everything that has to do with us yielding ourselves to him, whether it's with our body, our soul, our spirit, or whether it's with our time, and also with our talents and gifts. And to save us some time, I've got some people that are going to read uh, some passages of scripture here, and then... Um, you know, we'll see how that goes, but a lot of the scriptures that um, we will reference to tie you into some of the things we're going to talk about, you can jot down, make sure you read those later because they're, they're good passages of scripture talking about some of these things. So, uh, Pastor Sean, if you wouldn't mind reading um, what it is that I, what did I give you? First Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren... I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works in all and all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the, through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one's individuality as he wills. You want 27 through 31 too? Mm, yes. Okay. 27 through 31. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do you all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Okay, that was 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, and then also 27 through 31. 
Now Isaiah is going to read Romans 12, 3 through 8. Romans, tw- Romans 12, 3 through 8. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortion, he who gives with liber- liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Okay, that was, that was Romans 12, 3 through 8. And now Chancellor is going to read 1 Peter 4, 9 Not- through 11. Yep. Um, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its very various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now... Anthony is going to read Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what Every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Okay, so I, I, could, I could actually speak on every one of these for a very long time and uh, would love to speak on these for a very long time. But I think one thing that we see in the midst of all these passages of Scripture is this. Everybody has gifts. Hello? Acknowledge me so I can know you're hearing me. Everybody has gifts, right? Nobody is exempt. Everybody is to take notice. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit exercises gifts through us severally as he wills, right? And then our role, our responsibility is that we are to desire the best gift. Now, He's not talking about one gift has more quality than the other gift. He's talking about the fact that when we desire earnestly the best gift, we're seeking God, asking the Holy Spirit to work that best gift through us that's needed at the time. It is our responsibility to be good stewards of making sure that we're not trying to use a gift in a way in which it's not intended. Or wasting our time trying to use a gift that's not necessary at the moment. God wants the gifts to operate as he wills to minister to those who we are around. Amen? Amen. And so God's called us to be good stewards. To be faithful. To make sure that we are accountable. And and so it's important. So let's look at... Let's look at a little bit about what happens, and and, uh, I think Pastor Fred already attacked my scripture on this, but I'm going to do it anyway. But Matthew 25, 14 through uh, 21, and on. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to the one he gave five talents, to another two to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. 
Then he who had received five talents went and traded them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug it in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Verse 21 through 26. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me Two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have, faithful, you have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of, the, of your Lord. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look. There you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we know at this instance, it appears that this is talking about money. In the scriptures, a talent was a weight. And a talent in the scripture was equal um, to about 6,000 denarius. And the scripture are, are, it tells us, as you look that up, um, 6,000 denarius in that day would have been equal to somewhere in the vicinity of $18,000 today. And so what were, they, what were they to do? They were to take that that they had been given and put it to use and increase. So if God has given to me a talent, whether it's a talent of money, whether it's finances or what it is, I am to use that to make more increase for the kingdom of God. Amen? But same way if I make, if it's a talent, whether it's a talent or a gift, something that God has given me in my life to minister to others, I am not just to be content with that talent, but I am to seek the Lord, go after God, use that talent that God has given me, and God then will give me uh, more as as uh, I go along and and Paul also said so sometimes we take that as okay well the servant he he lost his talent that he was given so that means he must have lost out with God see that's proof that he loses out with God but we know that sometimes that can be the case somebody who maybe saw the kingdom but never really entered in could lose out not find themselves with God find themselves in an eternity without God But in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 11, it says this. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers through whom you believe? As the Lord gave to each one, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, and you are, you are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. 
If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So we know from this passage of Scripture that we can find ourselves um, building on that foundation, building on the things of our life. We can build wood, hay, and stubble. What happens to wood, hay, and stubble when it passes through a fire? It burns up. But when he says also, you can also build on that foundation gold, silver, and precious jewels. What happens when gold and silver and precious jewels pass through the fire? They become even more pure. And so he says, but, but listen, he says, even if that person, and I don't know how this can be, but apparently it can. I don't know how somebody can be a Christian and yet all their, all their works be burnt. I don't know how somebody can really serve Jesus and all their works can be burnt. But yet, here he uses this uh, example for us that apparently this could happen. That somebody could give their life to Jesus, but everything they did was for the wrong reason or purpose. How many of you know it's important for us to be led by the Spirit? How many of you know it's important for us to be led by the Spirit? Well, in order to be led by the Spirit, what do we have to be full of? The Spirit. the Spirit. And so if we want to have live works, we have to be led by the Spirit, correct? And so that makes me believe then somebody who is not filled with the Holy Spirit is going to have a lot of trouble differentiating between what is live and what is dead. What is, what is led by the Spirit or religious. God wants us to be led by the Spirit, and if we're led by the Spirit, then we're going to do live works. We're going to build on our foundations gold, silver, and precious jewels. I don't want to stand before the Lord one day, and I believe the fire he's talking about here is the Holy Spirit revealing. I don't want to stand before the Lord one day and then all of my works be burnt. Do you? I want my works to endure. Yes? And so what we want to talk about is gifts and talents. Well, when we think about that, we think about three different areas we're going to break this down to that we do here at Bethesda. And that is when we talk about gifts, we talk about three different areas. And the first group of gifts, we call them father gifts. We call them father gifts. The second area are son gifts, Jesus gifts. And the third area is Holy Spirit gifts. Now, in the father gifts, what we find is that every person that's born in this world could have these gifts. These gifts that we're talking about here, the father gifts... They are not just limited to those individuals who are believers. Anyone can have these gifts, okay? And so we're going to start to talk about what some of these gifts are. What, what it is that we're talking about when we say father gifts. One of the first gifts that we're going to talk about is administration. Administration. Some people, how many of you know, some people who don't know Jesus... Are administrators. They can administrate. What is the administrator? An administrator is the person who is, has the ability to organize and guide human activities in such a way that Christ's program can be carried out. But they can also do it for a company. They can also be somebody who's not even a Christian and do it for them. And we have an administrator right here in our midst. Her name is Heather. Just so happens, thank God, that um, she's a believer. And so she's moving everything in the process to um, complete it for the kingdom of God. Right? But an administrator could be somebody who doesn't even know Jesus. They administrate uh, and they do the things that people have given them to accomplish um, the things that's needed for their job, for their position, for their home, or, in our case, 
for the kingdom of God. So what about what is it a person? What is it that a person um, would um, have the potential to do if they have this gift? The person that has this gift has the potential. They like to help plan things in which people are involved. I want you to listen to these things that I'm reading off because I want you to be able to identify maybe a father gift that God has given to you. And so somebody who has an administrative gift is somebody who likes to help and put and plan things in which people are involved. They would enjoy giving direction to an important maybe church ministry. They would have a sense for how or when projects or ministries need to be better organized. Somebody can give them something and then they can be the ones who help to organize it and implement it so that it can be accomplished whether it's in the natural life or in the spiritual life. How many of you know we need administrators? The second father gift that somebody can have is encouragement. Somebody that doesn't know Jesus might be a real encourager. Huh? Have you ever met a positive person that just doesn't know the Lord? Sure. We've all met them. It's not just us. We can't take credit for it all that we're Christians and so woohoo, here I am. No, anybody can have a gift of encouragement. Anybody can have a talent to encourage people. But I want to make sure, and one of the things about the Father gifts, he gives us those gifts. He gives those gifts when people are born. They didn't just learn those things. Man, there's something natural in them that they want to do that. But what is God expecting? God is expecting that person when they give their lives to Christ, to use those gifts that he's given, even though it was given to them in the natural, to use those gifts in his kingdom as a part of the body of Christ. So what about encouragement? Encouragement, the, the ability to motivate people through encouraging words to live practical Christian lives. You can see that in Romans 12, 8. A person is there to um, lift up someone, to... Um, strengthen someone, to walk beside someone, to reassure someone, to console someone, to support others. That's what an encourager does. If a person has the potential for this gift or has been given to this, this gift by God, that person is sensitive to suffering. They're sensitive to people that are troubled and discouraged people and want to help them see God's answers to life's problems. I believe that people will grow to spiritual maturity through counsel and instruction in the word. Somebody who has the potential for this gift would be willing to spend some time each week in counseling ministry because they want to encourage people. Is that you? Don't raise your hand. Don't be afraid to raise your hand, though. We're taking names because trust me when I tell you, we have a lot of counseling needs. If you don't believe we have some counseling needs, come to school. <laughs> then we have those who have the gift of service. The gift of service. The ability to help others in their lives and ministries by aiding them in practical ways. Somebody who just, they want to serve. Now we're all servants, right? But, you know, there's some people that they're not just walking around saying, well, I'm a servant. They want to actually serve in different areas. They are willing to help you almost in anything you do. They have this passion, this desire to serve. And you know what? There's people in the world that serve others all their lives. But God wants uh, us to realize that he's given us that ability to serve because he wants the kingdom of God to have those who are serving in it. Somebody has the potential to see this working in their life in a greater way when they see other people's needs and they want to lend a helping hand and be ready to give it. Somebody who has this, it's their in their nature to, to want to do work and to help others. They, they want to and look for more opportunity to assist in other ministries. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. He came here to do what? Serve, not to be served. Another, another fathering gift is mercy. 
the ability to empathize with those who are hurting and to, and to translate that into cheerful acts of service. The gift of mercy is a God-given ability to sympathize with and minister to hurting people in an extraordinary way. You know, the, these gifts just don't, all these, all these things we're talking about, talents and gifts, they don't just come natural. They are, they're, they're given to us by God. Not everybody has the gift of mercy. We should all be merciful, Right? We should all be servants, but not all of us, not all of us carry those things out like somebody who really has caught on to mercy. <clears throat> when you talk about this, this uh, uh, gift of mercy, the potential for it, what is it, what is that person like? And I would like to minister to those who have physical or mental problems. The sight of misery makes me want to uh, help in a way to express God's love to hurting people. When I'm around this, I sense when people are hurting in some way and the gift of mercy begins to operate. Another one of the Father gifts is hospitality. Hospitality. The ability to welcome and graciously serve guests or strangers. Listen, there are some people that are just really, really hospitable. They love for you to come to their house. Then there are people who, uh, they're not very hospitable. When they see you pull up in the driveway, they turn their lamps out, they pull the shade down, and they hide. They're not hospitable hardly at all. But there's some people, man, it doesn't make any difference if they're getting ready to sit down for dinner. They invite you in and get a plate out of the cabinet and have you sit down right with them, even if they have to take less. They have this gift of hospitality. Somebody who um, has the potential for this to be their gift is sensitive to the acts of kindness that make such a difference for guests and strangers. When... when Listen, people that are hospitable and people who have a tremendous heart to serve, when we send out, when we send out things that we need meals taken in, these people that are hospitable, these people that have this heart, they're some of the first ones to respond. And they'll, they'll even tell you, you know what, if you have a hard time getting somebody, I'll be glad to do it another time. Hello? They tend to be more aware of needs of guests they tend to be more aware of needs of guests. In other words, people that are hospitable, they're not over there in that little corner in a little group talking. Their eyes are always out for the person that comes in that's new, and they want to go do everything they can to make them feel like they are welcome. <clears throat> they have a genuine appreciation for each guest, and it's that person that they want to minister to how many of you know we need we need more people with the gift of hospitality is that you is that you oh here's one we all love and we'll talk about this more uh on the 22nd i mean i won't but whoever does it will giving Do you know there's people that don't even know Jesus that are tremendous givers? Huh? There's people that don't know Jesus, and man, they give of all their time, Pastor Fred, to, and donate their time to other things. There's people that don't know Jesus, and they give finances, donations, gifts, to projects, to hospitals, to missionaries, to people in other, in other countries. They give a lot. It's the ability to support materially with generous, timely, and cheerful donations. It's a gift. This person that is a gift, has a gift to give is not looking at how much they gave so far. They're just willing to give. 
If you have this gift, you have the potential that you will feel moved to give when confronted with uh, financial needs in God's kingdom. When, when, matter of fact, this person that has the gift of giving has to be careful that they don't get ahead of the Lord because they're already ready. As soon as they say we're taking up an offering, they got their wallet out. Purse, checkbook, whatever. They're ready to go. They give cheerfully. They're willing to maintain even a lower standard of living in order that they can um, make sure that they can give to God's work. They have convictions that all I have belongs to God, and I want to be a good steward for the sake of his kingdom. Do you guys know that? We talk about 10%, we talk about tithes, we talk about praying about it, but do you know every bit of what you have in your hands, every bit of what you have coming to you, every bit of everything you own belongs to the Lord, not you? He's made you a steward of it. He's, he says he has even given you the power to get well. In other words, if it wasn't for the Lord, you wouldn't even have the strength to go do it. But he's given you the power of it. He's made you steward of it. And what God's looking for, he's looking to plant that gift of giving in people's lives who he can trust that will give because they realize nothing of what they have anyway belongs to them. That's powerful, isn't it? It's not mine anyway. I sit around and I act like it's mine, but it's not mine, it's the Lord. And so if I give to the Lord what already belongs to him, how many of you know he's going to give me back that much more? He's going to bless. And then these next two that are on here, music and arts and crafts, I just want to say that um, that's the gift that God gives to people that have creative abilities. They have creative abilities. The, whole, the Holy Spirit... God Almighty plants in them these abilities to do things such as musicians. David was uniquely gifted as a musician. Many others were appointed to special positions in the Old Testament because of their creative abilities. David's great poetic ability was a skill God had given him. But the Bible also talks about how there were craftsmen uh, in the scriptures that could build things and they were the ones that God used and moved on to build the temple and to bring those things, these great uh, structures and, and all the stuff that was built. God used them because of the ability that he had given to them. These creative abilities are theirs, and it's something that you just can't hardly teach. For some reason, they can just do it. Man, you know, you can, I can drive a nail. I can screw in a screw. But if you ask me to cut a board, I might bring it back four times just a little too long or a little too short. If you want me to build a wa uh, this car wash over here <laughs> that's been being built for how many years now that I don't know if there'll be a car washed in it before Jesus comes. But there's a car wash over there. How many of you... How many of you saw the walls go up on that car wash? How many of you drove in one day and the walls had fallen down? That's what would have happened if I was the craftsman at the car wash. If I was the one that put together the stuff, the devices inside the car wash so the cars could run through and get washed, we would be sued right off because after the first or second car came through, the devices would have fallen off and fell down on the car and somebody would have sued us. I am not a craftsman. I did not get that talent. I am that person that can say I'm kind of a, a, a jack of all trades and a master of none. But man, there, were, there are some that are craftsmen. People that have a potential for this gift. They enjoy expressing themselves creatively. They want to do it for God through artistic means, music, drama, painting, sculpting, building, and so forth. Over there's Andrew, who built our, our um, uh, sign-in cart outside. Isn't that right? It's been so long, huh? He built this pulpit. Yeah, I thought you were saying, no, you built it. 
The cart. I'm ta- I was talking about the cart. I hadn't got to the pulpit yet. Quit jumping ahead of me. The cart out there. Also, green cafes. Cart out there. This pulpit right here. We have other people here. Ricky's built houses. Brad and Jackie have uh, remodeled and built things that are beautiful. And people have those abilities, don't they? Pastor Doug can whip through here in just a little over a day and paint this whole sanctuary from top to bottom, two coats. Well, maybe not that fast, but it would... It would be done right, where if you let me trim out this sanctuary, you'd have to get somebody following me with some type of rag to get the paint off of the woodwork. (laughs) People have those abilities. And then there's people that are, they're just born leaders. Huh? They're born leaders. You, You have some of the worst people that ever lived in this world led people. Hitler, one of the most wicked, evil individuals that was alive on this earth and uh, not not much to look at but he had the ability to get a bunch of people to follow him and millions and millions of Jews were incinerated because of his leadership you can see that in many others they have the ability to lead a group caring concern and foresight Some people just have a gift to lead. If you have that gift, then you have have the potential to think futuristically about church and kingdom ministries. You enjoy leading, directing, and motivating others in some aspect of the Lord's work. And you're usually quick to sense when a group that you're a part of is spinning its wheels and you want to do something, right? Right? A leader doesn't want to sit and spin. That sit and spin thing, you know, as you had as a kid, anybody know those? Anybody remember to sit and spin? Come on, even you older people, come on. Man, I tell you what, after a while, I wasn't a kid that could sit and spin for hours. My little brother, uh, well, he's, he's the youngest, but... He would sit on that thing and go around and around and around and around. And I'd think, come on, dude, let's go do something else. And and he'd just keep on going. He could ride his big wheel around in a circle and just all day long, same path. And I, until I would knock him off of it and we would go do something else. Me, I, I don't like to sit and spin. A leader leads. Right? A leader leads. Then the Bible talks to us about... Um, These things that we have called um, Jesus gifts. Pastor Sean read to us about the Jesus gifts. They were the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. All of these here gifts are not given to those at birth. These gifts are given to those who have accepted Jesus Christ so that they can minister and be a part of equipping the body of Christ. Now, there are some that have and uh, walk in the office of the apostle, the office of the prophet, the office of the evangelist, the office of a pastor, and the office of a teacher. Those individuals, most of those individuals will also have what we call the, a, a gift to govern or the gift to rule. They are the ones who then find themselves in a position to be elders. They're the ones that have the weight of the government of the church and and, and the things of that nature on their shoulders. But yet each and every one of us who have given our hearts to Christ, we have the opportunity for us to have one or more of these giftings. Nobody, nobody on this earth has them all. Jesus was the only one that walked on this earth who had all these gifts operating in his life. He was the chief apostle. He was the chief prophet. He was the chief evangelist and so on. He was perfect in all these operations. He he operated in every single one of these things that we see. But you and I, we have... In our lives, one or more, most of us have a primary and a secondary gift 
that we need to understand and we need to acknowledge and discover that we have it so that we can fulfill what God is having us to do. I have to hurry up, so I'm going to just fly through these. The apostle, Romans 15, 20, talks about him. The ability to start new churches, to strengthen existing churches, overseeing their development. The apostolic gift, though, is a gift that enables somebody to help to start new ministries, establish new ministries, bring correction to ministries that have gone off track. They are the ones who have the gift and the abilities to do those things. The apostle is one of the true missionaries. They go, plant, fix, and develop. And then they want to go, plant, and fix again. Sarita and I, we did not even realize that this was anywhere near in my gift mix. And we could not understand why, God, do you have us go here for a year? Why do you have us go here for 18 months? Why do you have us go over here for four years? Why did you have us go over here for eight? Why did you have us go here for four? Why have you had us here for 13? Because we have an apostolic ministry to go in and establish and build and plant and correct and fix. But most of the time, God called us to do that until the church got to where it could survive and make its uh, place. And then we went and did it again. I'm just thankful the Lord sent us here and... I'm happy that I'm not going anywhere to do it again. Uh, I'm tired. Not really. I, I really feel like I could do it again, but I'm not going to. <clears throat> the prophet, the prophet, the ability to receive a, dom, a divine message and declare it to others. They speak to the church of things that have not yet taken place. They speak and foresight. They're looking forward. They help the church to be aware of entrapments. They help the church to be aware of situations or circumstances. They help the church to see clearer what is about to take place. They are not just people who stand up and say, I see God dumping a bag of gold coins over your head. I'm not saying that that Somebody might not see the fact that whatever, an increase is coming to you that you need to see. But, but prophets prophesy concerning things that are about to take place that no one else seems to be able to see. The evangelist. We have made this out to be somebody who just goes around and speaks from church to church to church. But this person that... Is, has an evangelistic gift as a person that they're everything, everything almost about them, their very heartbeat is seeing people come into the kingdom. They are kingdom-minded. They want to see people um, give their lives to Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter where they're at. Before they leave that place, they're going to be telling somebody about the good news of Jesus Christ. They may get spit on, they may get laughed at, they may get mocked, they may get beaten, but they're going to tell somebody about the goodness of the Lord. The evangelist is also, and should have a heart, not just to get people to make a decision, but they should have a heart to be gatherers. They're going out to gather in the harvest. They've helped plant, they've helped water. Others have come along and watered the seed, and they're going out to make sure they bring those people in. Because they recognize not only do those people need Jesus, not only did they make a, need to make a decision for Christ, but they need to also be disciples. Then there's the pastor. This is the shepherding side. This is the mothering side. The apostle, prophet, or fathering sides of the ministry. But the, but the pastor is the mothering side. It's the tender side. It's the shepherding side. It's the caressing side. It's the hand-holding side. How many of you know in a home, most of the time, not, not 100%, but most of the time there is a drastic difference between the father's relationship with the kids and the mother's relationship with the kids. My kids, when they were hurting, when they had hurt themselves, when they had fallen, when they had cuts, they went to their mother. And their mother, regardless of if they did something stupid or not, their mom would say, oh, honey, it's okay. Come on, mommy, I'll clean that off for you, and I'll put some stuff on it, and you'll be all right. 
and they came to me, I, I, I told them, I told them, hey, your mom's going to take care of that. She's going to clean that up for you. She's going to put that on. And then as soon as she's done doing that, I'm going to spank your tail because you weren't supposed to be riding your bike in the gravel to begin with. Not all the time, but I'm just saying. There's a difference. And what the church is too used to, their church is too used to mothers and haven't had enough fathers. And so the church gets offended when dad speaks. Come on. But this shepherding ministry is also needed because people need to have tender, loving care. Amen? And then there's the teacher gift, the ability to educate God's people by clearly explaining and applying the Bible in a way that causes them to learn. The ability to equip and train other believers in ministry. It's important for you, for the elders of the church, but for you to discover which of those you have. What is your primary gift and what is your secondary gift? You can discover sometimes who you really are and what you are by what you have had a passion for almost all your life. Things that you have wanted to do, things that you have been involved in, things that you have gone after, shows up in your life over and over and over again, sometimes then identifies with that. A lot of times people come in, they want to work with kids. Oh, I just want to work with kids. I want to be there for the kids. I want to help the kids. How many of you know we all want the kids to grow up? Amen. We all love the kids, uh, but not everybody wants to work with the kids. You hear me? Jerry Westerfield wants to hug the kids. I want to love on the kids. I want to speak into the kids as they go along, but I don't want to hang out too long. It's just not my gift. I, I, when, when I walk, Sarita will take somebody's chair. <laughs> we have somebody in the class back here that they can't, can't stay awake, and so he sleeps. So what Sarita does to combat that, and this sounds cruel, but she takes his chair away and makes him stand up. Or he can kneel, but he doesn't get his chair if he sleeps. When I walk by and he's sleeping, I don't even want to say anything to him about, give me your chair. I just want to find that slot on the back of the chairs like this. And I want to take my hand and I want to slap it real hard so it makes a loud racket. He jumps. <laughs> and then I say, how you doing, buddy? Good? Awesome. But we need them, right? Pastors, teachers. Then we have the Holy Spirit gifts. Holy Spirit gifts are fairly self-explainable, but yet we'll go through them real fast. One of the, and listen, the Holy Spirit, listen, the Holy Spirit can use anybody or anything he wants to. Okay? person does not have to be a Christian to prophesy. A person does not have to be even spirit-filled to pray for somebody and, oh, man, they got healed. Because God says his word will not come back void. Okay? But for the normal thing... The gifts operate through and by the Holy Spirit, and so in order for that person to walk in the fullness of what God wants to do in their lives and the gifts that he wants to exercise, they need to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues. Then you will bear the fruit of the Spirit in your life, you will progress and the gifts of the Spirit will operate on a regular basis or should operate in a regular basis in your life. They should operate every day of your life, not just on Sunday morning with the church. <clears throat> How many of you know the gifts of the Spirit weren't just for the inside the building? They're for at the meat counter. They're, they're at the grocery store. They're at the pharmacy. They are at the workplace, They're, no matter where you're at. That's why Chancellor here, being led by the Holy Spirit, spent three hours of his day talking to somebody 
about Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Holy Spirit pricked his heart not to hurry through that like a lot of us were. Or we'd give him some kind of little pat answer and then we'd forget the rest and just go on and do our thing. But no, three hours, man, I, I'm talking to this guy about, gee, why? Because the Holy Spirit's given him at the same time discernment to be able to know, hey, wait a minute, man, this is important. Isn't that what we're supposed to have? And, and so listen, I'm going to reiterate this again as we go into the gifts, why this is so important that we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's also important that we teach people the right way. When I pray for somebody here at church, they can shake, they can rattle, they can roll, they can get tingle bumps all over them, they can have stammering lips, but they have not received the Holy Spirit until they speak in tongues. Do not, do not be telling people, oh, you got filled, but you'll receive the tongues down the road somewhere. You cannot find that. That's out of your emotions. You can't find that in the Bible. That is not in the scripture. They said, how do you know? We heard them. We were there. We heard them. They're not supposed to go off. I'm not saying that can't happen. Somebody doesn't even have to come to church, can just give their heart to Jesus, driving down the road and be filled with the Holy Spirit. But that's not, that's not most of the time how it takes place. Because God wants them to have the evidence, not just for themselves, but others. That, that hey, yeah, man, you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have then the opportunity to be for the gifts of wisdom, wisdom, wisdom to work. That is not something that you have acquired through your life. Some people, because they're anti-supernatural, say the gift of wisdom is something that you have gotten because you have walked through life. Listen, the gift of wisdom that operates is not by anything that's in myself it is a supernatural operation from the Spirit of God that gives me wisdom on something that I would not have had. Knowledge, the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge is not where I do a survey with you and I discover some things about you and then I speak to you about that thing and you say, wow, you have a lot of knowledge. The, the word of knowledge is when the Holy Spirit moves as I'm praying for you and he gives me knowledge of something that's going on with you in your life or a situation and I speak to that situation and you know that I have no way of knowing that. Right? The word of knowledge. And then we have faith, where you say, man, I got faith. The Bible says, unto every man who believes is given to a measure of faith, or they wouldn't have believed. But, you know, we know that not everyone has faith. Not everyone has faith. Not, the whole world out here doesn't have faith. But when the Holy Spirit arrests you, one of the first things God does is he extends to you the gift of faith, a measure of faith, and then he extends to you the gift of repentance, you exercise that faith, you believe God, but when it's talking about faith here, it is a supernatural, at that moment, exceptional faith aspect that enables you then to do things like some of the things that are next, healing, miracles, things of that nature that are outside the realm of possibilities, faith to believe beyond maybe what even the measure of faith that you've been given. And what does he do? He gives unto man a measure of faith. That measure of faith is enough for you to accomplish everything that God wants you to accomplish in this life. That measure of faith is enough for you to fulfill the destiny that God has for your life. Well, how do I get to that place then, Pastor Jerry? Do I have to ask God every time you turn around, God, give me more faith? Do we pray, God, give me more faith? I don't have enough faith. God, give me more faith. Do we, do we, do we? If you can't answer that, get back in discipleship class. No, we don't do that. We don't do that, do we? 
What do we do if we want to see us be able to accomplish what it is God has given us that measure of faith for? What do we do with it? Hey, what? Exercise. My brain can say to my body, move your arm, but if I've never done anything with that arm, that arm's limp at my side, no matter how much my brain is going to say to that arm, move it, it's not moving. But man, from a baby on, if I started doing this, When that head says move, that arm moves. And when somebody tells me to go over and grab some logs to bring over to the fire, I can walk over and pick them up and bring them over to the fire. And so you got to exercise. What else do you have to do? Why is it important for us to do this other thing as well? Huh? Eat right. Think on those things that are pure, those things that are holy, those things that are wholesome. Think on those things, eat those things, devour those things, devour the Word of God. That's the very reason why we shouldn't be putting into ourselves, as Pastor Fred laid out for us. Uh, I'm not saying don't do your nails or don't get your hair fixed, honey, like <laughs> Pastor Fred kind of insinuated. I'm not doing that. But we have to be careful what our eyes see, as, as Andrew told us. We have to be careful what our ears hear. Why? We should be careful what we listen to. We don't want to listen to sensuality. We want, don't want to deal with things of that nature that drive us back to a past. We don't want that. Why? Because we want those things that God wants in us, those things that are pure, holy, to build us up in what? The most holy faith. We want, we want to be built up. That's why it's important for us to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit so we can pray in the Spirit. Paul said, I pray in the natural, I pray in the spirit. Why? Because when you pray in the spirit, you're building yourself up in the most holy faith. If you don't ever pray in the spirit, that's why you're weak. Hello? Well, I don't pray in the spirit unless I get all stirred up. Well, that's, that's your problem. You made the Holy Spirit an emotion. You've made the Holy Spirit an emotion. But I'm going to tell you what, I could right now take off and I could speak in tongues the rest of the time we're in this building just like I'm talking right now. Because it's a part of my life. He's just as real to me as English. And when I pray that, what happens? Your inner man is strengthened. Your inner man is developing. Your inner man is built up. You're praying in the, and, and he's building you up in the most holy faith. As Pastor Fred said, sometimes when I don't know what to pray, what happens? The Holy Spirit prays through me and for me because he knows exactly what to say. And the enemy can't sit there and decipher or know what's being prayed about. He does not comprehend it. Maybe we should pray more and talk less in the Spirit, right? Healing. Miracles, the ability to pray in faith specifically for God's supernatural. How many of you want to see miracles today? Healings. Then prophesied, you know, the Bible says to us, desire earnestly to the best gift. God tells us that the best gift, it's better to prophesy than to um, speak a thousand words in a known tongue. Unknown tongue, it's better to prophesy than to speak a thousand words in an unknown tongue. Because if you speak a thousand words, in other words, if I would start speaking in tongues right now, you would not be profited. But if I prophesy to you, hey, the Lord's speaking right now, and I prophesy to you, everybody profits. Everybody understands. God wants us to prophesy. How many of you think we need discernment? Another one of the gifts of the Spirit is discernment. And then we also see different types of tongues. This is not talking about the initial baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is the passages of scriptures that we talk about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, that people use to say that he's not talking about tongues when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because it says tongues will cease, prophecies will cease, knowledge will cease. But that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about the gift. How many of you know the gift is the Holy Spirit? The gift is the Holy Spirit. The gifts, plural, are these nine spiritual gifts we're talking about. And so when he talks about, when he talks about the gift of tongues, he's talking about the ability 
for you to minister to somebody that you come alongside of who speaks another language that you don't know. But at that moment, the Holy Spirit gives you that ability through the supernatural power of God to minister to them in Portuguese, in Spanish, in French, or whatever the language is. Amen? Amen. And then he has interpretation of tongues, which we do not see very much today anymore. Um, it's a message that's been given in, the, in, in tongues, and then somebody comes along and the Holy Spirit gives them the interpretation of what was said to make it edifying for the whole church. If somebody in church at the worship service on Sunday just takes off real loud in tongues, loud, 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 there needs to be an interpretation doesn't mean that I can't pray over here in the spirit when I'm worshiping. doesn't mean somebody else can't over here or wherever. But if it gets so loud that attention is drawn to that, then everything should cease and there should be an interpretation. Right? Do you have any questions about these gifts, these things that we have discussed? I know we went flying through it. But if you want to know a little bit more about the Holy Spirit, then we have things on that. And so, how many of you know it's important for us to be good stewards? To be good stewards. Don't be afraid. How many of you are afraid to take one of these sheets? Must be afraid because there's a lot of them left up here. How many of you are afraid to take one of these sheets? And determine what your, you want to hand them out? Determine what your time is spent on? Most of us don't even have to do that because we know it would not be pretty. How many of you know that we need to take care of this temple? Be good stewards of the temple of God? I think everybody, they all did a great job trying to help us to know that we have to be good stewards. God is calling us to biblical stewardship. He wants us to, and listen, listen, it's not that, it, that we're not talking about being good stewards of our money. We are because that's a part of it. But I tell you what, it's way bigger than that. You could be a good budgeter. You could have a great budget. You could be a good tither. You could be a good giver but you don't steward nothing else, you're still in trouble. God wants us to be faithful. Any comments or questions? Oh, Kyle had his hand up there. Anybody? There's a lot of stuff covered tonight. Go home, study it. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Anybody learn anything? Yes. All right, good. Tomorrow morning.